In this presentation, we will discuss the generation of year-end reports, comparing and contrasting them with the needs of the month-end reports within QuickBooks Online. For more accounting information and accounting courses, visit our website at accountinginstruction.info. Here we are in our guitar lessons and equipment file. We're going to go down to the reports on the left side. Now we're going to consider the standard reports, the balance sheet and the income statement, and consider what's going to be the same and what will differ as we do the year-end reporting. Clearly, we might want to do this on a quarter basis as well, and then the year-end reporting, and we'll have some overlap between the monthly reporting as we do this monthly and the yearly reporting. So let's consider that and think about how that might look. We won't go through the full process of printing them out. Same kind of issues with the printing of the month end reports. Let's start off with the balance sheet. So if we take a look at the balance sheet, now we don't have any new data in here. So we only have two months worth of data. So we're just kind of imagining what would happen if we were to enter this data for a year's worth of data. So we want the balance sheet as of the end of the year. So if we're going to have the balance sheet, it would be as of 010119 to 123119. The thing to remember with the balance sheet, and I ran that report, <laughs> the thing to remember with the balance sheet is although we have the date range up top, the end date is all that matters with the actual balance sheet report. So just remember that. We saw that when we had the year to date report as well, when we did the month end reports for January and February. When we just have one month of information, then we have the balance sheet as of the end of the month. And it can be a little bit confusing when we present the information to year to date information because uh, some people, you know, it's hard to really grasp the fact that the balance sheet is the same <laughs> for the December 31st, whether we're talking just the month end December 31st or the year end. So you may want to have the balance sheet and uh, present it twice, present it in the month end documentation that's going to be at the end of December, as we did with the example for, for the month and the two month uh, in the prior example. Uh, or or you can just print the balance sheet one time because it's the same report. So just as you do that, remember you, you want to kind of consider that. This is as of the point in time, as of the end of the year. Also just note that as you generate the balance sheet, you want to make sure that you've completed the full bank reconciliation, that you have everything done and entered and reconciled. And then this documentation you can then present and it might be something that will be used for tax preparation, although the major document for small businesses is the profit and loss report. So let's consider the profit and loss report. If we right click up top and duplicate, I'm going to pull the report from the left to the right. So now we have the balance sheet on the left and the new report on the right, which will be the profit and loss report that we will generate by going to the reports on the left side, selecting the profit and loss report. And then up top, we're going to say from 010119 to 123119, January through December 2019, run that report. So now this is going to be the, the range that we'll have January through December. So when we provide the year to date information or the whole year information, then of course we'll have this, this report, which will differ from say, if it's the end of the year and we have a month end report for just December. So we can then still provide the month end report for December and basically the full year type documentation, which is January through December which of course will show a different amount than the balance the balance sheet will be the same for those because it's the, as of the end of the time period the profit and loss of course will be different this will give us all the information for the entire year at the uh, end of the year so this will be the primary document that will be used in order to create the tax return most of the time for for the entities uh, of a sole proprietorship will need this and any type of tax entity. This is going to be the activity. This is what we typically are the basis on which we build the income statement is an income statement type report. We pay income tax on income, which is reported on the profit and loss or income statement. Now, if we had any payroll information, we'd want to basically print the payroll information as well. If we're processing the payroll, we would have the 940s, the 941s, the W2s, and we can provide all that information as the year in documentation as well. For most small businesses, even if we're not doing payroll, we may also want to provide reports related to vendors. Because the other thing they have to worry about is do they have to issue 1099s? So we have to deal with the 1099 reports. And there's a couple ways we can do that. So let's make another tab up top. I'm going to right click on this tab again, duplicate the tab, pull the one from the left to the right. 
And so now we have the balance sheet, the profit and loss, and the new tab. And then within the new tab, we're going to go down to the reports on the left side. We're going to scroll down now, going away from our favorite reports. And you'll, if you go to the expenses and vendors down here, you'll note that we have uh, a 1099 tran uh, transaction detail report. Now, this only is effective if we labeled the vendors as 1099 vendors, which we're not typically doing because all we're doing is entering the data directly into the system from uh, the bank account. But we might go through there and, and add that. We can easily add that to kind of our services or we can uh, at least give a, a report to help the client determine which of the people they pay might be subject to 1099s. Meaning, in a 1099, all it means is that we, as the person paying somebody else, have to basically, you know, kind of rat them out to the IRS or, you know, inform the IRS that they have received some money that they might have to ha pay taxes on. And that's all. It's just like a W-2 form where we're telling the IRS this person made money, you know, make sure that you take some of that from them. That's what a W-2 is basically saying when we give it to the IRS. This is the same. The 1099 is the same thing. They're telling the employer or the business that pays us so we're paying somebody that under certain conditions the irs is requiring us to tell who we paid so that the irs then knows to take money from them they have money the irs needs to know that so they can take it so we we and the, and the reason we have to do that of course is because we can get penalized if we don't if we don't do that so that means that we have to so we have to look at those conditions which basically means that the conditions are going to be you know, they make over a certain dollar amount and they're a contractor. They're not a business. So they're really concerned about smaller companies that are contractors because they're more likely not to report their income. So those are those are the ones that we're required to give a 1099 for, which is just basically saying, this is how much I paid this person. They're all yours. Go after them, you know. And so we do that. We could have this report or we could do the transaction list by vendor if we don't if we haven't set up the vendors. So we could just say, hey, here's a transaction list by vendor. Set up the date range 010119 to tw to <laughs> to 123119. 123119. This one populates as we go. And then here's all the people we paid that we set up as a vendor. And vendors are people that we set up as we enter the data uh, into the the system into the check register. So remember, every time we set up a new vendor, we have that information. So they can then go through this report and basically say, all right, how much, you know, who, who of these people are contractors and who of these people are then uh, people that are making over a certain dollar amount, which is really low. So if they're a contractor, then we probably have to 1099 them. And then they can, and then they can see what the dollar amount is and easily fill out the 1099. Once we have that information that the 1099 for them to fill out is really easy because that all they need is the name and the contact information we don't have the contact information because we just have the name from the bank statement so they're going to have to get the contact information and the uh, social security number and that's of course kind of kind of their responsibility or a business's responsibility as we deal with contractors so when we deal with a contractor which we know we're gonna have the 1099 we typically need to get their ein number and their uh, mailing address so that we can give them the 1099 that we're also going to issue to the IRS and, and tell them, you know, where they live and, and all that kind of stuff. So we'll go through here and, and do that. We could provide this report. Now, if we want to make this easier on them, that if we go through and say, hey, here are the conditions, we need contractors that aren't uh, corporations, then we can set, we can go through these vendors and actually set them up as a 1099 vendor and make this report easier to go through. So, for example, we could go to the expenses on the left side and we go to our vendors tab up top. And we know that ha Hamilton here was an employee, we said, but let's just say that this was a contractor. They said, now that's a contractor. And we're going to go, okay, so it's a contractor. We can then look at the details for this contractor. We can edit the details. So we'll say we're going to edit and all we're going to do is track the payments for 1099 purposes. We also might want to say, hey, you might want to give us the ad address of this contractor just so we have it on file and make sure that, you know, you, you know where to process the 1099 and you need to put that on the 1099 for them and to the IRS and to be able to send it to them. So then if we save this, then we can do that a little bit easier. Now, if we go to our reports down here, if we save reports, 
if we've gone through all the reports and said we know which ones are 1099s, then we can generate just a 1099 transaction detailed report. Just realize in practice, however, that this report isn't as useful as you would think, because in order to make this report, we're still going to have to go through all the vendors and determine at some point if there's any vendor that qualifies as someone that we need to track specifically. So whether we track them and, and tag them as a 1099 type vendor or not, at some point in time, we're still going to have to talk to the client and basically print out a transaction list by vendor and say, hey, here's all the vendors you paid. You're, you're going to have to just go through here and just double check that there's no vendors that might qualify for a 1099 so that we can then mark them off. And even if this is going to be our own books, we're probably still having the case where we could have entered something into our books and not picked up a vendor or checked that off at the time point period that we made the payment. So we're probably, in reality, we're probably going to still, at the end of the year, just going to have to go through the yearly custom of going through the vendor contact or the vendor transaction list and determining which vendors are, we need to pay uh, for and double checking that we have all them and, and then selecting those items. So it's not always saving time to then mark them off with the 1099 because we still basically have to run this report and just double check it anyways. For more accounting information and accounting courses, visit our website at accountinginstruction.info.